Hi, everyone. Um, it's one o'clock, so we'll get the presentation underway. Hopefully, you've already had a chance to check out this sound check slide. Um, hopefully, everybody is able to hear me right now. If your audio is not working properly, it might be because you haven't selected the right speaker. So click the arrow next to the speaker icon and try choosing another one. Um, so with that, we'll get our webinar underway. Thank you so much for joining today's session. It's the second webinar of our co-designing the Active City series of three webinars. The second webinar, as the title suggests, will explain how to put participatory urban planning um, into practice. And the Active Neighborhoods team wants to thank you all for being here today. We're glad to see such strong interest in our webinar series. Um, so briefly, our mission today is to explore five citizen engagement tools to implement participatory urban planning projects in your municipalities or neighborhoods. Um, I'll be your presenter today. My name is Francis Nasca. I am the Evaluation Coordinator for the Active Neighborhoods Canada Project um, at the national level, as well as a Project Manager at the Centre for Active Transportation um, based out of Toronto. And my background is that I have a Master of Arts in Sustainability Studies, where I did research into participatory planning and building equity um, in citizen engagement processes. So briefly, for those of you that are new, um, the Active Neighborhoods Canada Network is a pan-Canadian partnership between three organizations, the Montreal Urban Ecology Centre, the Centre for Active Transportation, and Sustainable Calgary. Together, we've worked for about 10 years to develop, pilot, and share approaches to co-designing green, active, and healthy neighborhoods. We work with neighborhoods uh, to with communities to build neighborhoods that support walking, cycling, and other means of active transportation for everyone by providing safe and welcoming urban design. And our approach, um, which we call participatory planning or co-design, is situated at the crossroads of health, equity, and the built environment. Um, so the plan for today, I'll start with a very brief recap of the first webinar in our series for those of you that missed it. Then I will uh, discuss the concept of salutogenesis, which is a kind of a promising but less known concept of how we think about human health. Um, subsequently, I'll address a few questions that we should ask ourselves before designing a citizen engagement process. And then most of the webinar will be spent exploring five specific concrete co-design tools to implement and five case studies to complement each of those tools. Then we'll finish with a short Q&A period. Um, so with respect to the Q&A session, um, we'll address the questions orally at the end of the session. I'll stop at around 1.45 um, and leave about 15 minutes to answer your questions. So you're invited from this point forward to use the chat box on your screen to um, enter your questions um, and don't hesitate to put them in at any point. I have a colleague on the other end who is compiling those questions for us. Um, it's also worth noting that this webinar is currently being recorded, so the presentation along with all of the sources in the Q&A will be archived on our website after the broadcast. So if you know anyone who couldn't attend the session today or if you want to refer to it as a later date, all of the content will be available at participatoryplanning.ca. All right, so let's hop right in. Um, I'm going to start with a brief review of our first webinar. I'll try to keep this to a couple of minutes because that webinar is also available on our website. So in the first webinar, we presented um, some information to help uh, illustrate the links between the built environment and health. We discussed a report from the Public Health Agency of Canada on, the, um, on designing healthy living, which illustrated some clear links between the built environment and health and the ways that the built environment um, impacts health issues like mental health, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and other chronic disease. Um, however, we also illustrated how health is not impacted the same for all of the populations living in our city. We discussed a concept called health inequity and explored how certain uh, health concerns such as heat islands, collisions, uh, poor access to green spaces, poor access to health institutions might disproportionately impact citizens from certain social and economic backgrounds. Um, and we also looked at how participatory urban planning could be used to address these health inequities and reduce the risk of death or disease for vulnerable populations. Um, so why is participatory planning a solution? Um, it's a solution because it enables a confluence of two types of knowledge, citizen knowledge and professional knowledge, and it seeks to specifically engage the voices 
instances of people who might be more likely to experience health inequities in their built environments. Um, it also enables the collective identification of solutions. So citizens work directly alongside professionals to make sure that solutions um, are considering the very needs of citizens all the way throughout. Um, and then it also enables the continuous involvement of citizens and stakeholders throughout all of these six phases of the process, um, which I won't go over today, but you can learn about um, by visiting that first webinar. Um, so for today, we want to discuss this concept of salutogenesis. Um, as we work to design healthy neighborhoods, we kind of keep this principle in mind. It's a principle that says that we should focus on the origins of health and well-being rather than on what causes disease or death, a concept that's known as pathogenesis and that is fairly commonly um, how we think about human health. The idea, um, so when you apply this to built environments, the idea is that a neighborhood is made up of multiple assets that keep its population healthy. These assets can be things like bike lanes, parks, um, tangible things, or they could be things like a strong sense of community, organizations in the community, social services, and more. The idea then is to build upon these assets and build from what works well instead of just focusing on what does not work. And ultimately, these are ways to build the capacity of individuals and communities to maintain health and well-being. So in summary, the principle um, is, it says that we shouldn't just work to make resources like bike lanes and well-maintained active transportation networks available, um, but we should also ensure that people have equal access to these resources, um, regardless of their social or economic or physical traits. And it considers that people, um, regardless of these conditions, want to and can use these resources effectively if we plan with accessibility and efficiency in mind. So by taking into consideration accessibility and efficiency of the assets that we make available, we can help to reduce inequities and offer the same chances to be healthy, uh, to, to be healthy and to reach a complete sense of well-being for all. To carry out this task, though, public participation is incredibly important. Um, only by involving the voices um, that need to use these assets will we understand how to make them accessible and efficient for the people in our communities. Um, so with that in mind, we'll hop into some questions to consider when designing a public participation process. It's important to ask yourself the right questions before involving citizens. Although public participation is necessary, consulting the public in purely a symbolic way or in a way that's just to check off a legal box can actually create more challenges than what it solves. Um, it can lead to things like um, citizen skepticism in the government or opposition to projects or the ideas being suggested by professionals if people feel that their voices haven't really been meaningfully considered. Therefore, it's important to find answers to these kind of key questions before starting a participatory process. The first thing to consider is why do we want to involve citizens? And hopefully the answer to this goes beyond because we have to. Um, the next is what's the main goal behind the citizen involvement? Um, what types of information do we need to learn about the environment that we're trying to influence and how can we reach out to people to do that effectively? And then the third is what kind of results are we hoping to get? Are we looking for qualitative information, quantitative information, a mix of both or more? Um, so by clearly answering these questions, you will um, have a good foundation for building your public participation plan. Beyond picking up ideas and suggestions from, a public, from the public, these will help a clearer purpose to emerge uh, for why you're working with citizens and how you should do so. From your answers, you'll be able to better identify what types of activities to develop and then develop the most appropriate ones according to um, that plan. So the way that um, on our website, we have about 25 co-designer participatory planning tools available for you to use, and they break down into a few different types of tool. Um, do you, for example, um, there's tools that allow us to get a better understanding of a place, to help create a new vision for that place, or to evaluate how the components of a public space are or are not working together. So if we're trying to understand the space, we might want to get answers to the following questions. We might want to know if the place is visited and how people interact with the place, um, if it's used in the way that we've planned it, um, and if there's any conflicts between different users of the space. Um, if we're trying to bring citizens together to um, create new visions for a place, 
We might want to focus on things like which needs must the project meet, which solutions should be prioritized, and um, what are the missing planning elements in the space. Finally, if we're trying to evaluate a space, we might want to consider questions like, is the site uh, appropriate or inappropriate for what we have planned? Um, what types of behaviors would we like to promote or change? And are there any improvements to make that we haven't yet thought of? For each of these objectives, there are different activities that can be coordinated um, according to your needs. Um, but, uh, but what's really important to remember here is that it's virtually impossible to cover all of these objectives in one single citizen activity. So your citizen engagement plan should really include activities that go all throughout these different phases and types of activities. Um, so to that end, we'll um, show some concrete tools to each of these objectives, presenting five tools and five case studies to give an uh, idea of their impact on the community. Um, most of the tools we're presenting today are ones that have been developed as a part of the Active Neighborhoods Project, but we'll also highlight um, some from other, other folks working in this space, in particular some tools from the Gallup Institute. Um, throughout the case studies, we've also weaved in a fictional case that helps us to understand how these five tools could work together to form a robust and complete citizen engagement process. The first tool we're going to cover today um, is called an exploratory walk, and it's a tool that helps you to understand the public space that you want to enhance. The exploratory walk is a field observation method that's usually done in small groups. It helps to identify both the positive aspects of a neighborhood's public spaces and its areas of concern um, through the lenses of the people that are using the space most frequently. Um, it's an open-ended tool that brings people together to explore and observe public spaces in the neighborhood. Depending on the types of materials you provide to participants, such as observation sheets, base maps, safety rating scales, and more, walking can provide valuable qualitative data about neighborhood public spaces, streets, and sidewalks. Empowering residents to lead and host these walks is an excellent way for them to share their lived experience and to position them as leaders and knowledge holders, um, as people whose um, input is really important and essential early on in your engagement process. Um, for each tool, we'll also cover who's the target audience, who do you want to engage with this tool. And in this case, um, residents and people working in the neighborhood are the main target audience of the exploratory walk. However, um, it's important to also invite decision makers, planning professionals, and local partner organizations so that they can hear firsthand from the residents um, what their experiences of the public space are like. Um, for each tool, we'll also cover a few facilitation tips. All of this stuff is available in a little bit more detail on the website. Um, but for this, we recommend allowing residents to be the people that are actually leading the walk having them facilitate smaller groups of about six to eight people um, so that everybody's able to hear and provide feedback as you walk and talk. We also suggest inviting elected officials and planning professionals to help um, gain some buy-in for the support of the implementation in the future. So in this, the context in which you might use this tool are almost infinite because it's so open-ended. However, to better understand, um, we're going to weave this into the example of a fictional case that uh, could benefit from using the exploratory walk. So in this fictional case that we'll use throughout, Henriette is a planning professional in a municipality of roughly 20,000 residents in Ontario. Um, for the purpose of this exercise, we'll call this fictional municipality Henryville. The municipality has an iconic commercial artery, but it's slowly um, kind of losing some ground. Um, there's more vacant shops and fewer users, and it's getting a little bit run down. With this in mind, elected officials would like to understand what's causing this decline in their commercial artery. So for this, Henriette will opt for an exploratory walk. In order to um, properly diagnose the problems, she composes a committee with shop owners, residents, employees, and um, some people from her planning team. And she invites them out to these walks. She chooses this tool in order to clearly identify from the eyes of, their user, eyes of the users, um, due to their local knowledge and lived experience, the problems and issues that they experience when they use this place, and also identify some of the positive assets that they want to build upon. The data collected, collected is qualitative and is especially in the form of testimonies and opinions from participants' experiences. 
Um, so for further information on this methodology, including a facilitation guide, um, you can visit our website, participatoryplanning.ca, and under the resources tab, you'll find our co-design um, exercises toolkit. Um, now, to bring this into a real life case, we'll chat about um, some work that our partner, Sustainable Calgary, has done to develop a guide to create more active, connected, and healthy spaces um, in the catwalks in the city of Calgary. This guide includes a series of engagement tools, including the exploratory walk. Um, and the links to all of these resources and all of the other resources mentioned in the webinar will be included in the bibliography on the registration page of the webinar if you want to explore this catwalks playbook. So to illustrate the impact of the exploratory walk, we'll turn to the community of Marlboro in Calgary. The catwalks in Marlboro are numerous. There are more than 130 communities with catwalks in Calgary, um, and Marlboro is amongst these. A catwalk consists of a pathway that cuts through street blocks um, in communities, and it's designed to shorten distances and improve pedestrian movements between residents, schools, and park spaces. Um, so these pathways can be really useful, but they haven't been very well maintained. And because of this, many residents in Marlboro avoided using these spaces despite their usefulness. To make them useful again, Sustainable Calgary wanted to make the spaces more active, safe, vibrant, and accessible. Um, so they used an exploratory walk to first diagnose the problems in the area. Residents, along with Sustainable Calgary, the City of Calgary, and other local partners identified some safety issues and infrastructure gaps during the walks. Um, the diagnosis that emerged was related to the fact that the pathways required maintenance. There was a lot of overgrown um, vegetation and a need for snow clearing. The paths were unlit and dark, making people uh, feel unsafe traveling there at night. And they were also just kind of dull, uninteresting, and boring. There's accessibility issues as well. You can see this has a gate that would be tricky to navigate with a wheelchair or a bicycle or a stroller. Um, so to make them useful again, oh, sorry. So today, um, after the concerted efforts of the community, um, they took the results of that exploratory walk and took advantage of those observations to transform the catwalks. Um, they added greenery and food producing plants, uh, pavement markings on the ground to signal passages and give better visibility. Um, and they also just added some solar lights along the pathways to um, allow for some lighting at night in a way that's very affordable and accessible um, that doesn't involve a lot of investment from the municipality. Finally, um, they added art pieces and decorations of all kind to make the pathways more attractive and welcoming for all, um, which for some people has even resulted in more physical activity. Um, for example, this woman who shared a tweet um, saying that she purposefully takes a longer walk home just um, in order to visit one of these beautiful new catwalks. So that's a little bit about the exploratory walk. We'll move to a second tool called the Complete Streets Game, which is a board game developed by the Center for Active Transportation. To understand this tool, it's first important to understand what a complete street is. Um, so a complete street is a street designed for all ages, abilities, and modes of travel. On complete streets, safe and comfortable access for pedestrians, bicycles, and transit users, and the mobility impaired is not an afterthought, but an integral planning feature. The Complete Streets game, therefore, um, aims to bring together ideas and opinions from residents um, on the components that they would like to see in a complete street. Um, it's a board game with 110 magnetic pieces representing scaled roadway segments. It's bilingual and it can be played individually at like pop-up kiosks or in small groups at workshops or in classrooms. And it helps to build consensus on options for a street design that could fit within your designated right of way with. This tool is valuable because it enables almost an infinite number of unique combinations of elements within the right of way. Um, it creates a legible record of different community visions for the space. And by creating and comparing their ideal streets, participants um, are able to understand the um, benefits and trade-offs to certain, using certain types of infrastructure and design in the streets. 
the game is adaptable to multiple contexts, such as um, co consultation stands and workshops, and it makes planning concepts a little bit more accessible uh, to everyone and encourages people to collaborate. Um, professionals can work alongside citizens because no expertise or experience is required in order to play the complete streets game. Um, this tool also targets residents and employees of the area that you're working within. Um, and it's important to also invite planning professionals and decision makers. They can help to explain some of the nuanced concepts that residents uh, might miss in the game. And again, it can help to build buy-in for implementation down the line. Um, while you're facilitating this activity, we suggest that you invite participants to take the, their neighbors into consideration. The game even comes with some character cards that encourages people to think about the street through the lenses of different users, whether it's somebody that's uh, visually impaired or a wheelchair user, a senior or a parent with a young child, so that we're sure that people are thinking about different needs as they design the street. Um, we also encourage people to um, create more than one possible scenario um, to really try out options. And we also invite you, if you're interested in um, having some workshops or facilitator training um, on the Complete Streets game, to get in touch with us at TCAT at cleanerpartnership.org. You can also get in touch with that email address if you would like to purchase copies of the game. Um, we are currently sold out, but within the next two weeks, they'll be back on the shelves, uh, a new and improved version of the game. So uh, looping back to the fictional case of Henryville, um, we can now explore where you might apply the Complete Streets game in your engagement process. Following the diagnosis fed by the exploratory walk, the elected officials of Henryville try to figure out which planning forms to opt for. And they also wish to hear from the users of the street about the street they'd like to redesign. Before asking engineers to lead large scale projects, they want to explore various planning scenarios. They're looking for a dynamic and tangible method uh, where citizens can work alongside planning professionals like Henriette um, to design the street. So they land on the Complete Streets game. Now that they understand one of the potential factors causing the decline of the commercial artery, the elected officials want to create street planning guidelines so that the street can be redesigned to better suit needs. Um, while revitalizing a commercial artery with a complete street is not the only solution that exists, many sh studies show that investing in human scale public spaces and neighborhoods is a win-win situation. Um, so our fictional situation might not cover all of the possible things that Henriette and her team might um, wish to consider during the redevelopment of the commercial artery, but revitalizing commercial arteries through complete streets is both innovative and proven as a way of generating economic activity um, and making spaces more inviting and accessible. So after, um, so Henriette decides to host a workshop where she brings users of the street together along with business owners and planning professionals. She commissions facilitation experts to conduct the workshop with the complete streets game. Um, the, present, the workshop starts with a presentation introducing the concept of complete streets and information about the street to redevelop and explains how the game works. Then participants break into groups to try out different configurations of the game. To get some more input, Henriette also decides to host some pop-up kiosks with the game at busy times right along the commercial artery so that she can reach a broader set of citizens. So again, the facilitation guide for this tool can be found at our website, participatoryplanning.ca, and it can be purchased um, online once those new versions are restocked in a couple of weeks at tcat.ca. Um, I also wanted to just briefly cover an online tool called streetmix.net, which uh, serves a really similar purpose to the Complete Streets game. Um, it's The game is similar to Streetmix, but it, it works a little bit better for um, in-person engagement activities because it's a little bit more tactile. People are around a table moving pieces and talking, um, but these two tools can work really well together. So also to help you to inspire Complete Street projects and learn more about the concept, we'd encourage you to visit Complete Streets for Canada website um, curated by TCAT that is a policy and design hub for Complete Streets projects in Canada. And there you'll find lots of valuable resources, including uh, this new publication, De Rue Inspirant, um, 
which is a new set of inventory of different complete streets projects in the province of Quebec. There's a counterpart one in the province of Ontario as well. And stay tuned because the second edition of uh, this tool, De Inspirant, will be launched at the end of September. So as an on-the-ground case study for the Complete Streets game, uh, we'll turn our attention to George Street South in Peterborough, Ontario. George Street South is the gateway into the downtown commercial core in Peterborough. As one travels north on George Street, the street divides into two paired one-way downtown streets. However, for a stretch of a couple of kilometers just south of the downtown core, George Street was a four-lane arterial road with no bike lanes, few pedestrian crossings, and very little in the way of amenities for active transportation. Since the corridor is a vital gateway into the downtown, the city decided to redesign the street using a complete streets approach. So um, prior to the complete streets redesign, this is what George Street South looked like. There is four lanes of traffic, two in each direction. There is no bike lanes. The sidewalks were directly against some very fast moving traffic and it was very difficult to cross. There is few um, signalized crossings throughout this stretch of the road. Um, so in order to solicit some citizen um, feedback on how to design George Street, during the planning phase of the project, the city of Peterborough used the beta version of TCAT's Complete Streets game to engage citizens alongside professionals. So at workshops and events such as the Peterborough and Kawartha's Bike Summit, people were encouraged to try out different options for the street. Um, this took place very early on before the city spent a lot of time and resources creating detailed designs. Um, and from there, a few different options for the street came out, but a clear vision for the street actually emerged. So the final design that was built on George Street is reflected in the images on this slide, shown both of the components of the Complete Streets game um, at the bottom, so that's what it would look like built with the game, and then also is an actual after photo of the street on the top. So today, George Street looks different. There's now a single vehicle lane in each direction with a center turning lane allowing people to make left-hand turns without impeding traffic. With the extra space reclaimed by removing the vehicle lane, bike lanes were added. On-street parking was replaced with a grass boulevard and street trees that now separates pedestrians from the road on one side of the street. And there's also new friendlier pedestrian level lights. A pedestrian refuge island, which you can see in the bottom left corner, was um, installed in intervals along the length of the street in order to make crossings safer and easier and to provide some space for rain garden plantings, which are a nice soft infrastructure that helps to mitigate the flood risk. So the third tool that we'll chat about today is called tactical urbanism or pop-up infrastructure. According to Wikipedia, tactical urbanism is a type of low-cost temporary change to the built environment that is intended to improve neighborhood streets or gathering spaces. So after understanding the area of interest, tactical urbanism proposes temporary installations that are quick and easy to install to help demonstrate the potential changes to the site. You can use it at a street, an intersection, or a public space. You can use so many different materials for this, um, including small cones, bollards, flower boxes, paint, benches, planters, installations of many different things. The goal is to see how the changes would influence users' behaviors um, without having to spend all of the money to make the permanent change. And this tool is valuable because sometimes permanent changes in the built environment can be slow and expensive to enact. A tactical urbanism intervention is a great way to speed things up in a manner that's quicker, cheaper, and community driven. Pop-ups can demonstrate how the safety and vibrancy of public spaces can be improved through residents' design visions. They're fun and they're also an excellent advocacy tool. Demonstrating that an idea works is a wonderful way to gain support for your project. Um, so the target audience here is planning professionals and decision makers, but also residents and local partners um, can be involved in helping to set up and obviously use your pop up. Um, when you're doing this tool, it's important to make sure that you're increasing safety with your pop up and not unintentionally creating an unsafe road condition. So for that, work closely with your municipality and other local partners to develop and implement the pop up. 
Um, it's also really important to record how people use the street or space before the pop-up and to measure how things change during and after the pop-up to make comparisons. And take lots of photos and survey users um, of the site to see how they feel about the changes. So in the case of Henryville, um, the participants of the Complete Streets game imagined some very creative, interesting, and actually very plausible scenarios. However, the elected officials were reluctant to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in such a radical uh, transformation, fearing that it w wouldn't really work or that it might even have unintended negative consequences for some of the local uh, shop owners. So in terms of a uh, cheap and easy solution to try this out, Henriette um, brings forward the idea of trying tactical urbanism to test some of the good suggestions made by citizens. They decide to try greening the area by adding small trees and flower planters. They replace one parking lane with a bike lane by using orange cones and widen the sidewalks with temporary bump outs. Henriette knows that tactical urbanism allows them to achieve specific objectives by um, demonstrating and evaluating what the infrastructure um, could look like. By taking care to consult residents and democratically choose the best scenario arising from the creative workshop with the Complete Streets game, Henriette and her colleagues develop a plan for temporary features to be installed and work to, with the municipality to ensure that they have appropriate permissions for their pop up during the intervention, they and they also, before the intervention, observe how the space is used. During the intervention, they observe and record the use of space. Um, we'll give, the next tool will go into a bit more depth on how to observe and record this information. Um, so that way they're able to know if the space has shifted from the baseline data they collected before the pop-up. And then after the intervention, they develop a short report about the successes and shortcomings of the pop-up to use as a tool to advocate to make the permanent changes. Um, once again, this resource um, is available There's some on our website. Um, and if you also want to dig a little bit deeper into the concept of tactical urbanism, there's a bunch of inspiring case studies in the United States um, that are available on the Safe Streets Academy website, which I encourage you to visit. Um, and to illustrate the impact of a tactical urbanism project on a community, we'll actually go a little bit further afield outside of our own project communities this time and look at a case study of the Near Northwest, a neighborhood of about 1,500 people in South Bend in the United States. Um, and this neighborhood was, in, was encountering some speeding issues on their streets. So several public consultations, including online surveys and pop-up workshops, were organized to obtain um, some feedback on the speed issues in the city. The Riverside and Hudson intersection was one of four intersections identified by residents as dangerous. Um, so there is some other pop-up projects that happened at the other intersections in the city, but we'll focus on Riverside and Hudson. So after identifying this intersection as a problem, um, the city worked with citizens to develop a plan for temporary features, um, including a traffic circle, bump outs, and explanatory signs. As you can see on the photo, orange cones, small trees, and even the use of pavement on the ground can be used to temporarily delineate the space. Um, so pop-ups can really be that simple. A local artist was also involved in this project to share his talent and make the project a little bit more visible and dynamic through mural paintings on the road. Um, a tip discovered through this experience is that when using paint, it's good to opt for fairly large and simple shapes, which allow for the use of roller brushes, that, and that can save time and also enable citizen participation in the creation of the street mural. So in terms of impact, it can be seen that the four temporary installations tried out in um, this community all um, resulted in a measurable, I'm sorry, a measurable reduction of speed in the neighborhoods, um, especially in the case of the traffic circle, which is the one that we examined. So once the team installed their traffic circle, one out of every three drivers drove 25 miles per hour or less. It's also interesting that as a result of these pop-up installations, the city has generated support from the community and elected officials for future traffic calming projects and other safety improvements. The team will use this experience to develop a traffic to calming toolkit that can be used by other communities in the city to make safer streets for residents. So as I mentioned briefly before, 
Active Neighborhoods Canada isn't the only group working to develop and share innovative citizen engagement tools. With the same idea of providing planning professionals and decision makers with tools, the Gao Institute has developed some excellent tools to observe public life and spaces, and we've used, used and adapted some of these tools in our own contexts as well. One of these tools, which we'll cover today, is the People Count, and it has the objective to understand and evaluate public spaces. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> All right, and so we'll take a closer look at this tool. So counting is another field observation method done, um, and it can be really useful because it can be done very flexibly um, by individuals. And with this tool, we can count and observe a multitude of things, including um, how the breakdown of users um, of the space interact with the area according to age, gender, and activities or interactions with public space so that we can understand who is and is not using a space and how. Um, what we especially like about this tool is that the quantitative data that it generates and the fact that it can be used to improve projects or influence decisions. It enables us um, to count pretty much everything to get a holistic understanding of how the space works um, it's easily modifiable and it can be done, um, you know, on people's own time. So citizens can take this count sheet and make their observations, re return it to you, and you can start to build a robust set of data. Um, the target audience for the tool is planning professionals and decision makers. And um, when you're using this tool, if you're in a busy area, it's helpful to use a clicker counter instead of a um, pencil and paper if there's too many people passing by. We also encourage you to spread the counts over a long period of time if you want to compare different times of the day, week, or year. But make sure that you count for intervals of at least 10 to 15 minutes per hour per observation site. And this can provide a relatively accurate picture of the daily rhythm of the site. Um, so we also suggest, of course, that you count before and after transformations to the public space. So in the case of the tactical urbanism, you would use this count before installing it and then after installing it um, so that you can know if the changes meet your desired objectives. So once again, the context which we can use this really open-ended tool are numerous, but we'll return to our fictional situation for better understanding of the implementation. Um, so still wanting to only invest in a project that will please residents, the elected officials of Henryville want to ensure that the temporary installations on the commercial artery actually produce the expected effect, which is to revitalize the space and increase the amount of people visiting it. Therefore, during the experimental phase of tactical urbanism, they opt for a user count. In terms of accessible, reliable, and practical tools for assessing public space, Henriette knows that counting people is the go-to method, since it enables the observation of specific behaviors. Indeed, it will allow professionals to grasp the success or limits of pop-up infrastructure by observing the increase or decrease in the number of visitors. It will give a good idea of the liveliness and attractiveness of the space and will guide users towards the final development of a plan according to the data collected. So um, here's what Henriette does. She commissions and trains observers who um, are members of her own team as well as residents and shop owners, once again, that use the space. Uh, she coordinates the observers and assigns counting periods and locations. People make their observations and then come back to Henriette and give her the data they've collected. She compile, compiles and analyzes the data and captures the highlights and develops a report about the use of the space. So a facilitation guide for this is again available on our website and there's also a reproducible sheet that you can just print off from galinstitute.org, um, which is a website in which you can learn a lot about public spaces, how we study them and why we should get interested in them. Uh, so for a case on the ground in one of our projects, um, we will turn to the Tejas Roy in Montreal in the Plateau Montreal neighborhood. The section of Roy Street um, became a temporary pedestrian street in 2017, and it's slated to become a permanent pedestrian street this year for all 12 months of the year. Right now, there's temporary installations such as terraces, relaxation islands, and a community garden currently installed, and the vast majority of users really like it, especially in the summer. 
However, before making the whole thing permanent, the borough wanted to understand um, and undertake a diagnosis to identify the strengths and challenges of winter installations. So they wanted to observe the issues regarding accessibility um, on the site in the winter. They also wanted to document use of the site by counting users on the section of the street. So in fact, um, in the winter, the counting showed that only 93% of users I'm sorry, the counting showed that 93% of users chose to use the sidewalk rather than using the central path in the new pedestrian street. Um, so also, the main use in this section of the street during the winter was just transiting through. 90% of the activities observed were people passing by rather than lingering. So um, arising from this uh, observation and the user's profile and use of the site, a better portrait has been made. It's helped our partners, the Montreal Urban Ecology Center, to make recommendations to the designers for how the site can be improved for a year-round pedestrian street. They suggested to enhance winter animations, plan for better snow removal and maintenance alternatives, and in the final design, predict where the snow will pile up and how it will be removed so that there's spaces for snow built into that final design. So in brief, the tool gives a thorough understanding of the space under study. Um, I'm going to go really, really quickly through our last tool since I know we are getting close to the time limit for um, having time for questions. The fifth tool, also developed by the Gell Institute, is called the 12 Quality Criteria, which are 12 criteria that make a place enjoyable. A space must provide, for instance, protection against traffic and accidents, protection against unpleasant sensory experiences, options for mobility, options for seeing and sitting, and more. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip through this slide a little bit, but in short, the goal of this tool is to understand and evaluate public spaces. Um, it consists of another field observation method that can be done by people individually on their own time, um, where they score the space based on each of the quality criteria um, on themes uh, around protection, comfort, and pleasure, and evaluate whether the space is, is working. Um, the tool is interesting because it can be applicable to a variety of public spaces, such as parks, squares, streets, and more. It can be used any time of the day or week or year, and it allows for the initiation of conversations and citizen engagement. Um, the target here of who you would want to engage is planning professionals and residents. Um, it's recommended to take lots of notes during the observation about the behaviors you observe and why you've rated something uh, a certain way on each of the criteria and to compare the results um, between different observers to see if people are experiencing the space similarly or differently and to try to get to the root of why. So in the case of Henryville, now that we've understood our commercial artery through the exploratory walk, We've reimagined it with a complete streets game. We've installed the temporary features via tactical urbanism. We've evaluated um, the impact of that tactical urbanism through a people count. We'll now begin to um, come up with a final design by integrating the 12 quality criteria into the final plans and specifications. So the goal of this tool is to understand the space and evaluate what's missing to make it become the safest, comfortable, and most pleasant uh, space possible based on these 12 criteria. So after um, commissioning and training observers um, who are users of the artery and residents, Henriette plans a field observation and takes care to equip her team with clipboards and pencils for note taking. As a result of the observation, the data are compared, giving rise to rich discussion, and Henriette captures highlights in order to take them into account during the final plan for the site. Um, so this tool you can download again at gellinstitute.org. Um, you can also find it in the book How to Study Public Life, which is available both in English and now through a, a partnership with our partners Muek as well in French. Um, and so we're going to turn quickly now to a, a case study that's still in progress. Uh, it's a case of the Saint Laurent Commercial Hub in Montreal. Um, so the aim here was to review the urban developments of the last century and figure out how to improve them and modernize them a bit by integrating pedestrian scale developments where walking is encouraged and highlight places of interest and increased diversity of use. Um, so the 12 quality criteria were used to develop an evaluation grid that was used to study public spaces during um, an ideation workshop or design charrette. 
and scores of up to 10 were given on each criterion. So the diagnosis um, uncovered that there was some precariousness in this sort of pedestrian, in this sort of strip mall area. There is dangerous intersections, heat islands, and a lack of green spaces. Um, so based on that, some proposed ideas were brought forward, and this is a visionary rendering of how this space on the top can be transformed to better integrate the 12 quality criteria. Um, so uh, that kind of wraps up our five tools and five case studies. I encourage you to check out the co-design activities toolkit. There's um, facilitation guides to the tools that we mentioned as well as dozens of others available there and the public life tools on galinstitute.org. Um, so I think we're just perfectly on time to move into our q and I'll exit the PowerPoint here to pull up some of the questions. Um, let's see. Put the link to the website feature. I'm not sure I see any questions coming through quite yet. Um, you're welcome to use the chat box right here if you do happen to have a question. Questions, okay. Um, so we have a question here from Anna. Would we um, elevate the tactical urbanism to, to evidence-based through experimental design research? Um, I'm not, I'm, I hope that I'm understanding the uh, question, but I think that what the person is asking is, can we use the tactical urbanism to do some more robust um, research um, and to generate some evidence-based approaches to transforming public space? And I think the answer is yes. Um, there's lots of cases where tactical urbanism has been used, um, and the results of those temporary installations have been evaluated um, quite thoroughly to understand um, how spaces can be enhanced in a more permanent way. Again, um, I would direct you to the Safe Streets Academy website they have a lot of great examples of tactical urbanism, and our website and the facilitation resources on there also show some um, pop-up projects that we did research and evaluation on um, during our own Active Neighborhoods Canada projects. Um, I see a question in the chat box that asks, what are the major changes made to the second edition of the Complete Streets game? Um, so based on some surveys of purchasers of the first edition of the Complete Streets game, we've added some new road segments. Um, we've added multi-use trails. Uh, we've added some wider options for the vehicle lanes because we heard that the standards that we used um, were limiting for uh, particularly rural and suburban communities. Um, we added high occupancy vehicle lanes. We enhanced a few segments like our pedestrian islands. Um, and we created some new materials like a quick reference guide so that you're able to see what the segments represent at a glance. And more information about the new version of the Complete Streets game uh, would be available on our website, tcat.ca. Uh, question, do you have any experiences in participatory planning exercise geared towards children, youth, and teens? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, there have been um, everything from a young urbanist summer camp, which is like a three-day uh, participatory planning curriculum for youth um, available in that co-design exercise box um, on our website, um, to using the Complete Streets games in classrooms. So we've worked with children um, as young as grade four or five up through high school and university classes at the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, so the Young Urbanist Summer Camp, I can actually go through the toolkit right here. I think people can see my screen. Um, if we can take just a second, it'll load. So to find the toolkit, um, first of all, it's in this drop-down tab resources. 
um, close this little pop up. We'll discuss that later. And the Young Urbanist Summer Camp, I think, is on the last page because they're organized alphabetically. And this gives a curriculum for a youth focused participatory planning um, course. And it gives also some examples of how it's been used in some of our projects. So I would direct you there. And um, the Complete Streets game is, again, another really great and easy activity to facilitate with youth and in classrooms. Um, and is there a way just to order the extra new pieces to augment existing Complete Street games? Unfortunately, um, there's not, only because of the way that we work with our magnet producer. They're not able to um, produce those individual segments. They come as kits. So I'm sorry for that, but um, if you have purchased a previous game and you're interested in those pieces, you could get in touch with me and we might be able to send you the PDF files and you could print them and add them to your own kit. Okay, uh, question, any reflections on doing walking tours as a tool? Good numbers for participants, amount of time, how much ground to cover, practically speaking. Um, yes, so in addition to the exploratory walk, the toolbox does include a number of um, different walking tools that you can use that have specific themes. Things like an emotional mapping walk, an empathy walk, uh, a participatory infrastructure audit walk. In all of those cases, um, I would recommend having um, a facilitator per every six to eight folks that are involved in your walk. Um, if you go much larger than that, your group kind of spreads out a little bit too much and conversations can get really disparate. So it can work for any number of people, but uh, be prepared to have residents volunteer as leaders or facilitators um, to make sure that you have um, folks that can help to lead each group of six to eight. Um, for the amount of time, um, I will go in an hour to an hour and a half. Um, in some of our neighborhoods that we've worked in, we've done these walks with a lot of folks that have mobility challenges. So you'll want to make sure to pre-plan a route to ensure that it'll be accessible for people. And you'll travel really, really slowly um, during your walk. So you'll often stop and chat at different key points along the walk. So if you're looking at mapping it out on Google Map, you might be looking at something that you know, an able-bodied person could walk easily in 15 minutes and expect that that'll take at least an hour um, as an exploratory walk. Um, plan also for weather. It can be nice to have like a set of umbrellas and things that you bring along to your walking activities in case people um, are really prepared for that. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, does anybody else, I'll give maybe one or two more minutes for other folks to give uh, questions in the chat box before doing our wrap up. Any more that have come to my email? I don't see. Okay. Um, I'll head back to the PowerPoint now, and of course, if another question comes up, um, please do get in touch with us. Um, we're happy to answer questions on an ongoing basis. There is a, a contact form on the website. Um, so with that, thank you so much uh, for coming to our second webinar. Um, we really hope that you've appreciated it and that it will help to serve you in the future. It's worth noting that our next English webinar will be held on Wednesday, November 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, it will present, <coughs> excuse me, some inspiring public policies and projects that focus on health equity. So if you're registered for this webinar, you'll automatically receive some information about the next ones via email as it becomes available. And we'd invite you also to stay tuned via our social networks. So details will be forthcoming. And before you leave today, um, you might have seen as I went to our website, I closed off that pop-up box. I just wanted to invite you to um, learn a little bit more about the box uh, that, that, I'm sorry, the campaign that was featured in that box. It's called Let's Have a Conversation About Healthy Places. And it's a nonpartisan movement that provides an opportunity to initiate dialogues on sustainable urban planning and active transportation between citizens and elected officials. 
So um, this tool can be really useful uh, to bring the topic forward to your next public discussions or debates that are taking place in advance of the federal election that everybody knows is happening this October, and to showcase how the development of healthy communities is really everyone's business and is essential um, component for our elected officials to keep in mind. Um, so in addition to just this tool, we do also have a new policy toolkit also available on participatoryplanning.ca, which links you to resources to help structure workshops, propose directions to influence public policies, and help your community join the movement for healthy places. So again, on behalf of the entire ANC team, thank you so much for being here today. Um, a link will be sent to your email with an evaluation form. We would really encourage you to complete it so that we can continue to improve um, our webinar series and to make sure we're delivering to you the content that you want to learn. Um, so with that, we'll wrap up for the day. I really appreciate you joining me this afternoon and we hope to hear from you some more. Thanks and uh, look at the, stay tuned in the coming days and this webinar will be posted on our website.